Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for attending our webinar, um, Governing and Protecting the Antarctic and Southern Ocean. Um, I'm Nicole Bibo. I am the uh, coordinator of EUPolarNet and the current chair of the European Polar Board. And these two organizations are organizing this webinar. Uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes, uh, Renuka Bade, the executive uh, secretary of the European Polar Board, will introduce uh, the governance of Antarctica and the Southern Oceans to you. And we thought this is a timely um, webinar now. Uh, since we are approaching the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting in uh, Helsinki, which is starting end of this month, uh, this is a good opportunity to introduce uh, the system all around the governance of Antarctica to you. Uh, I will not say anything more and pass the floor to Renuka. Uh, one final thing, um, in case you have questions, and we hope you have a lot of questions, please type them into the question and answer um, uh, system here uh, in the video conference. And we will then, after the meeting, uh, post the questions to Renuka. Um, either I will read them or we will even ask you to um, post them directly. We are not too many people at the moment. So Renuka, it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, yeah, it's your turn now. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Nicole. So as Nicole said, I'm uh, currently serving as the Executive Secretary of the European Polar Board. And we are an organization that looks at both the Arctic and Antarctic um, and, it, and the European perspectives on both of these polar regions. I'm here today to give you a short introductory lecture on um, the governing and protecting of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean. This, this webinar will be what in academic circles is known as a 101 webinar. So it's going to be quite broad, but not a huge, not hugely deep. Uh, and it is intended to be more of an introduction to, to the Antarctic and Southern Ocean governance that um, for those individuals who don't really have too much knowledge on this aspect. Uh, a quick note, we will be recording this webinar. Uh, so, and this is for uploading on both the EPB and EU Polonet YouTube channels. Um, and with that, we quickly give it a go. So the, the main difference between the Arctic and Antarctica is that the, the Arctic is basically sea that is surrounded by land. Um, and so you have a lot of countries that surround the ocean, which means um, uh, the this, this North Polar region, the Arctic region is, is mainly the ice covered region that you see here uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean. The Antarctic is slightly different. It's actually land that's surrounded by oceans. So you have Antarctica, the continent here, which is surrounded by quite a large ocean, the Southern Ocean. And that's a free flowing area around the Antarctic um, that has a very large, uh, a very large um, biodiversity um, and it's quite a good flourishing ecosystem in the Southern Ocean uh, with everything from phytoplankton up to large whales, seals, penguins, um, and a lot of marine birds that thrive there as well. Um, what you see is a lot of ice um, in Antarctica is actually, this This is kind of the landmass if you strip off the ice. So you see that there's a lot of land in Antarctica as well. Um, and the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean is, is very much connected to the rest of the planet. Uh, here in Europe, we look at Antarctica and the Southern Ocean and it seems quite remote and unconnected, but if we see this uh, projection and if we see the currents that exist within the global oceans, we see how closely they are, they are connecting um, the Southern Ocean to, to our European shores as well. Antarctica has had interest from quite 
quite a long time period in you know, from Maori oral, oral history. We know that there has been interest. Um, there's been world maps from the 1500s uh, that show some presence of a continent uh, south. A lot of the European explorers have also also been interested and have traveled to lands south of the known continents at that time. Since then, uh, there was there was discovery of more and more abundant marine life. So the interest only grew in the in the southern continent, in the southern ocean, and, and Antarctica. Um, we have the start of whaling and the start of sealing periods. Um, and with that, we also had the start of scientific interest in the southern in the southern lands. Um, with the veiling and sealing came the recognition of economic and geopolitical values of the Antarctic. Um, and Antarctica has several territorial claims which are currently held uh, in abeyance. Uh, there are claims that are also overlapping between different countries as is shown in, in the map in this slide. Uh, but the Antarctic Treaty has held all of these claims um, in, in what is called as abeyance, but basically it's kind of a suspended animation. How did the science start in Antarctica? The very first international polar year uh, was held in Antarctica from 1882 to 1883. And that's when really the, the interest in having the Antarctic set aside for science started. Uh, the first international polar year was followed by a second one in 1932-33. And then we had what was the extremely successful international geophysical year, which was the third IPY. But the international geophysical year really culminated into ensuring the protection of the Antarctic and putting science as a cornerstone of that protection. Um, the International Geophysical Year uh, led to the start of what is the what is now the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research as well. And then, just as an aside, the planning for an for the fifth International Polar Year, the fourth one was uh, 2008 to 2010. The planning for the fifth International Polar Year has just started. Uh, with the same SCAR, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, getting together with IASC, which is its Arctic counterpart. And organizations like the EPB are also amongst the many partners that are involved with this planning. But let's go back to the Antarctic Treaty again. Uh, we saw that uh, SCAR, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, was formed in 1958. In 1959, on the 1st of December, the Antarctic Treaty was signed. Um, the room that is shown in that in that photograph is where most of the negotiations for that treaty for that treaty took place. Uh, the original signatories there were 12 countries um, that were the original signatories of of this treaty, and that included both the United States and and the then USSR. Uh, this treaty was quite um, quite a fantastic example of how cooperation could still succeed in what was then ongoing as the Cold War. Um, in as of today, we have fifty six. We had twelve original signatories, but today we have fifty six countries that have acceded to the treaty so far. We have twenty nine consultative parties that have uh, decision-making abilities. And then we have 27 other non-consultative parties which have no decision-making abilities within the treaty system. Uh, like I said, the, the treaty was signed in, in an era where suspicion and, and um, suspicion between different countries was thriving under, under the Cold War. But the treaty could set aside Antarctica for peaceful purposes and it prohibits, it expressly prohibits 
any measures of a military nature. The area that is covered by the Antarctic Treaty is the area that is south of the 60 degrees south. And science is kept as a cornerstone of the Antarctic Treaty. The treaty specifically states that freedom of scientific investigation in Antarctica and cooperation towards that end um, should be the basis of, of work in, in the Antarctic. As with scientific knowledge, international cooperation also is a cornerstone of the treaty. Um, the treaty allows for information regarding any planning for scientific programs in Antarctica to be exchanged between different countries. Um, this permits the, the, the best efficiency of any operations in the Antarctic. Um, scientific personnel can also be ex exchanged in the Antarctic between different stations and expeditions. And also information has to be freely available. So any data that's collected, any scientific observations and results that are obtained from the Antarctic are to be made freely available for everyone. Um, as I was talking about the claims before, uh, basically the there are claims from countries uh, from from uh, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, France, Norway, Chile, and Argentina, and these are currently held in abeyance. No new claims are supposed to be. Um, no new claims or enlargement of any existing claim um, is possible while the present treaty is in force. And the two big countries, the US and the USSR, maintain the basis of a claim within the treaty system. Uh, but all of these claims are held in, uh, in suspension, uh, in abeyance until the treaty is in force. Um, the way the treaty, uh, the to ensure that the provisions that are given within the treaty are observed, all of the areas of Antarctica, including any stations or any of the other infrastructure within the Antarctic or any equipment that's within that infrastructure, has to be open at all times for inspection. So one country can go and inspect other countries' operations to ensure that they are acting within uh, within how the treaty determines. The decision making in Antarctica is carried out by the annual meeting called Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting. This is a once a year consensus based decision making uh, on all the legal and institutional matters on scientific cooperation and environmental protection on any of the areas of interest that arise during the year. The ATCM uh, is defined as uh, being for the purpose of exchanging information, consulting together on the matters of common interest pertaining to Antarctica and the formulation and recommendation to the government of measures in furtherance of the principles and objectives of the treaty. This is. Um, this is set within the Antarctic Treaty in Article 9. Who participates in the ATCM? The main participants are the consultative parties. Uh, the consultative parties are the ones that have the decision making power. Then you have the non consultative parties, which are the governments that do not have a decision making power. And then you have um, observers, which are organizations like the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, then the Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which is CAMELAR, and the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs, or COMNAP. In addition to all of these, there are also several invited experts um, that can provide that can provide information to the to, for the working of the ATCM. And those include the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, um, the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators, and many other international organizations that are participating in, in these processes. And I will deal with all of these later. So how do these decisions that are taken in the treaty meetings uh, translate into law? 
Antarctica is basically governed by international law under this under the Antarctic Treaty System. So anyone who visits or works in the Antarctic is subject to the laws of the treaty that have been ratified by their home country. Um, so when you have national representatives that are that are participating in the ATCM, uh, the decisions that are made in the ATCM are carried by these national representatives back to their home governments. And those binding decisions from the ATCM are then translated into national regulations. And these national regulations extend to all of the citizens when they are um, in Antarctica. All of the parties that participate in the treaty have um, reaffirmed their strong commitment to keep um, the Antarctic Treaty going and very strong uh, through what was the Prague Declaration on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty. And the text of this is available on, on the Antarctic Treaty website. So um, in summary, we have quite a quite an acronym soup here, uh, but this is this is really an outline of all of the different organizations that are involved uh, in the Antarctic governance um, within the Antarctic and Southern Ocean regions. So we'll deal with each of these organizations um, in, in the next few slides. So the first, um, first thing we'll deal with is the, the main Antarctic treaty system um, and, uh, and it's and its associated, uh, its associated agreements. The Antarctic Treaty System itself comprises of several different agreements. Uh, so you have the Antarctic Treaty itself, and then you also have the conservation of Antarctic seals. Uh, you have the uh, conservation of Antarctic marine resources, conservation of Antarctic marine living resources, then you have uh, the Convention of the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resource Activities, which was never ratified. But then you also have the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, this is also known as the Madrid Protocol. This is the this is the this is the protocol that established the Committee for Environment Protection that we will look at. So just a quick look at the different um, at the different conventions that that are currently existing. So we have Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Seals, and this was concluded at London in 1972, and then uh, basically registered by the UK in 78. This is applicable for all of the different seal species that exist in the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. Then you have the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which is CAMLAR, that was uh, ratified. It was signed in 1980 and then entered into force in 82. Um, CAMLAR looks at conservation and rational use of not only krill, but also different other fish and other marine living resources that, uh, that are present in the convention area. The, the area that is regulated by CAMELAR is slightly different to that that is regulated by the treaty. Remember I said the treaty looks at the area that is south of 60 south, whereas CAMELAR looks at um, the area between 60 south and the Antarctic convergence. Um, and this, in some places, this can be, this can be north of the 60th parallel. Um, it is important to note that Kamlar works on an ecosystem approach to conservation. So this requires that the effects on the entire ecosystem must be taken into account when managing the harvesting of any marine living resources. Then we have the protocol on the environment protection to the Antarctic Treaty. This is also called the Madrid Protocol. Uh, it was signed in Madrid in 1991 and entered into force in 1998. The Madrid Protocol designates Antarctica as a natural reserve, which is devoted to peace and science. And then Article 3 of the Environment Protocol sets, sets, forth, sets forth basic principles that are applicable to human activities in Antarctica. 
Um, and additionally, Article 7 prohibits all activities relating to Antarctic mineral resources, except for scientific research. The Protocol on Environment Protection established the Committee for Environmental Protection. Uh, this is an expert advisory body that provides advice and recommendations to the ATCM in connection with the implementation of the Environment Protocol. The, the Protocol on Environment Protection just had its 25th anniversary, and again, there was um, a declaration set aside by the participants to reaffirm their reaffirm their um, reaffirm their activities and and their uh, support for the work carried out by the CEP. The Protocol on Environment Protection works with a core set of environment principles, which is the protocol itself, but it also additionally has six annexes that are set aside. Uh, and these annexes look at particular issues uh, to do with to do with the, the work being carried out in, in the Antarctic and Southern Ocean. So Annex 1 looks at the environmental evaluation uh, of any activity. Annex 2 looks at the conservation of Antarctic flora and fauna. Annex 3 looks at waste disposal and waste management. Um, Annex 4 looks at prevention of marine pollution. Annex 5 looks at area protection and management. And then Annex 6 looks at liability arising from environmental emergencies. The Committee for Environment Protection, uh, as I just said, was established by the Environment Protocol. Um, the participants in this Committee for Environment Protection are the representatives of the different parties to the protocol and also quite a few observers. The CEP also meets annually to discuss the status of the Antarctic environment in general and also the implementation of the Environment Protocol. The CEP provides a report with recommendations to the ATCM. The CEP's discussions are guided by their five-year work plan, and that work plan lists out high priority areas, um, uh, environmental issues that, that the CEP would like to tackle. Some of, these, uh, some of these issues are management of risks associated with non-native species. Then we have management of environmental impacts of tourism and other non-governmental activities. Um, understanding and responding to the environmental consequences of climate change in Antarctica and also improving effectiveness of a protected area management um, and ensuring that the uh, and enhancing the protected area system that currently exists. The CEP also develops different management tools. Uh, for example, there is an environment impact assessment uh, for conservation of flora and fauna, for environmental monitoring, for marine pollution, protected species, um, waste from past activities, historic sites and monuments, and many more. The work of the CEP doesn't stop between the two meetings, uh, between two meetings. And the CEP meets once a year on the side of the Antarctic Treaty meeting itself. But in between these two meetings, the CEP carries out its intersessional work on the CEP forum. Um, and it provides its annual report to the CEP on by two specific subsidiary groups. One is the subsidiary groups, um, subsidiary group on management plans. And then there is another subsidiary group on the climate change response. So these, these subsidiary groups carry on the work of the CEP um, intersessionally and then provide the results and then provide the report um, to the CEP at the meeting. One question that we are quite often asked those that work within the treaty system Will the Antarctic Treaty end in 2048? Um, there are several flavors to this question, but in a sense, the question is always, will the Antarctic Treaty or the protection end in, 19, uh, in 2048? The short answer is no, 
but there's obviously a longer answer to that. The, the protocol on environment protection and the Madrid protocol that I've been talking about for the last few minutes, it, it really, it, it officially designates Antarctica as a natural reserve and it has implemented a clear ban on any activities relating to Antarctic mineral resources, except for scientific research. And this ban remains in place indefinitely. After, four, after 50 years of ratification, so after, in 2048, if any consultative party requests, a conference can be held to review the operation of the protocol. Now, any modifications that are suggested um, would have to be agreed by a majority of Antarctic Treaty consultative parties, including three quarters of those that were consultative parties when the protocol was signed in 1991. For those changes to then become, come into force in international law, Further ratification by three quarters of the Antarctic Treaty consultative parties, including all of the original consultative parties that signed the protocol. Ratification of all of these parties will be needed. And in any case, even if the parties agree to the lifting of the prohibition on mining, mining cannot occur until a comprehensive binding legal regime on Antarctic mineral resources, resource activity is in force. So this really makes it an extremely high bar, making it very, very unlikely that there will be any change in 2048. So that's a slightly longer answer to the, no, the, the treaty will not come to an end in 2048. So going back to the different aspects that are covered within the Antarctic Treaty System. Uh, we have we have the ATCM, we have the Committee for Environmental Protection, the CEP, but the the treaty system can also additionally call a special meeting of experts if it so wishes. And a few of the last the last four meeting of experts that have been called are given on the screen now. Um, that have been on shipping, tourism, and climate change. So we've looked at most of these, the major parts of the Antarctic Treaty System. So what do we look at next? We look at some of the observers, observers that participate in the treaty system. The Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research and the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs are extremely important participants within the Antarctic Treaty System as they act as advisors to the treaty system on scientific and operational matters. The Antarctic Treaty followed on from the scientific success of the IGY, as I, uh, as I said a few slides earlier. So scientific research has been the main, main activity on the Antarctic continent. And that underlines the, the importance of both SCAR and COMNAP. Both, of, both the Antarctic Treaty and the Environment Protocol emphasize the importance of science and scientific cooperation within the treaty system. And so SCAR and COMNAP are um, quite important participants within the Antarctic Treaty system where they act as advisors on scientific and operational matters. Then we have the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. Commercial tourism has steadily increased since the 1950s. Um, most tourism operators that are active in the Antarctic belong to the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. And they have been, and they work IATO works quite closely with the treaty system to ensure that any activities are um, taking place are um, are well within the within the realms of the treaty system. There is a specific update that was provided to the general guidelines for visitors from the treaty uh, uh, in 2021, and these include. Uh, general advice for visiting any 
any location and to ensure that these visits do not have any adverse impact on the environment or its scientific and aesthetic values. Then we have um, ASOC, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition and other NGOs that participates within the treaty system. The Antarctic treaty systems works with various global non-governmental organizations uh, for ensuring the protection of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. And some of the main organizations are Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, which is an umbrella organization that brings together many of the global NGOs that are active in environmental protection, along with other NGOs like uh, the United Nations Environment Program and IUCN. And these are invited as observers to the treaty meetings that take place. So back to this, we have looked at the observers and now we look at the, the final set of organizations uh, that are also active within the Antarctic and Southern Ocean. So let's look at uh, we have the International Maritime Organization, IMO, that also participates within the treaty, um, within the treaty system. IMO is a specialized agency of the UN, and it's responsible for the safety, security, and environmental performance of shipping worldwide. And what we have, uh, the Polar Code, uh, that's entered into force since 2017. And the Polar Code introduces mandatory and legally binding safety and pollution prevention measures for cruise ships and large cargo ships when they are visiting polar waters. And this Polar Code was adopted by, by the members of IMO and it was the very first agreement of its kind created specifically for the polar regions by the IMO. Then we have SOLUS and MARPOL. SOLUS looks at SOLUS is the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea. Uh, and this is an international maritime treaty that sets minimum safety standards in the construction, equipment, and operation of ships, um, and including ships that operate within polar waters. And then you have the International Convention on the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, or MARPOL. This is the main convention that covers prevention of pollution of the marine environment by ships from operational or, or accidental causes. And MARPOL regulation adopted to protect the Antarctic from uh, pollution by heavy grade oil in 2010. Some of the other wildlife protection agreements that are also in, and that are also active within the Antarctic and Southern Ocean we have the IWC, which is the International Whaling Commission. IWC was established in, uh, in 1946, and it's the global organization responsible for management of whaling and the conservation of whales. IWC mandates, mandate includes uh, bycatch, bycatch and entanglement, ship strikes, ocean noise, pollution and debris, and sustainable whale watching. In 1994, the IWC established a Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary uh, that surrounds Antarctica and bans all types of commercial, commercial whaling in the area. Then we have the Agreement on the Conservation of Albatrosses and Petrels, which is ACAP, which was signed in 2001. And that was in response to concerns over dramatic decreases in seabird populations, particularly albatrosses and petrels in the Southern Hemisphere. And then we have the overarching convention on the for the conservation of migratory species, um, which provides coordinated legal frameworks for conservation of species throughout their migratory range, including when they're passing through the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. So I hope this has given you a little bit of a flavor of um, the different aspects that work within uh, the protection of, work for the protection of Antarctica and, and the Southern Ocean. And hopefully it's given you a good idea of the Antarctic governance. Um, 
governance organizations that are working quite hard to protecting the Antarctic and Southern Ocean for tomorrow for everyone. Thank you, Renuka. Okay. Um, um, I think that was a very interesting overview about uh, how the Antarctic is governed. Personally, I think there are many, many things we could discuss in more detail, especially <clears throat> when it comes to all the different boards and advisors and so on to the Antarctic Treaty. But nevertheless, it was a very, very good overview. Thank you very much, Renuka. And uh, if there's nothing more to say, I would close the webinar now. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to all of those that came and listen to this slightly wide ranging talk. I see in the audience quite a few experts from within the treaty system. I hope I didn't say anything um, which caused any concern, but um, I think this was really intended to be a very quick look at what are the different protections in place? What are the different organizations that work within the system? How does the protection and governance of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean work. So that, that I hope this was, this um, solved its purpose. Yes, I think so. So um, yeah, then thanks a lot to the audience, uh, to those who have attended, to you, Renuka, and the team from the EPB and EU Poland and helping us. And I think it will not be our last webinar on an Antarctic topic. So thanks a lot and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.